All right. Today's uh, Inside Baseball Little Lutheran World Coffee Mug is KFUO Radio. Um, our Senate has a radio station out of St. Louis, kfuo.org, if you were to go there. Uh, they've been operating for a long time, uh, made famous in their early years, in the early years of radio, by a program called The Lutheran Hour. Has anybody ever heard of that? I wouldn't blame you, you're all young enough that that's probably not on your radar. But The Lutheran Hour, with the very first Lutheran Hour speaker, Walter A. Meyer, the first, um, was a national radio evangelism service that got a lot of publicity. He made it, he made it big. He was a, an excellent preacher. Um, he crafted well. He, he was a seminary professor who just learned this new technology called radio really well and knew how to hold attention on it. Um, and lots of people found the Lutheran Church, in particular the Missouri Synod, because of Walter A. Meyer, the Lutheran Hour. And so some churches even had on their signs, not just Missouri Synod, but the Church of the Lutheran Hour, because truck drivers and people would find our churches based off of that. Um, it's had its, it, it kind of had its heyday then. It never really transitioned to television with televangelists quite like other places did. However, Billy Graham gave a huge eulogy at Walter A. Meyer's funeral. So he influenced other generations of big name uh, evangelistic preachers. They still have the Lutheran Hour every Sunday morning at like six or something. And a lot of our parishioners will listen to it before coming to church. And uh, the current Lutheran Hours, so they go through Lutheran Hour speakers as often as one comes up and then gets a job somewhere else or whatever. Um, and I don't get to listen because I'm working Sunday morning. I got other things to worry about early that day. They've also come out with a bunch of other resources through Lutheran Hour Ministries, kind of grew out of that. KFUO has its own programming every day. I've been a guest on a couple of their programs where they'll have different pastors on to talk about stuff. Um, so you can go to their website and look up some good Lutheran programming. One of the best media resources, though, that our Synod has is actually not officially af officially affiliated with KFUO or any Synod entity anymore. It's a, a program called Issues Etc. And you can go to issuesetc.org and find them on wherever you get your podcasts. They're a very well-known Christian podcast hosted by uh, a pastor of our synod, Todd Wilkin. They used to be a program on KFUO, and under a previous presidential administration, there got to be some tension between this program, which is a very Bible-focused, confessions-focused, sound Lutheran doctrine program, even though they're not always doing Bible studies and confession studies, they're doing current issues for two hours a day. They bring on guests from even outside of Lutheranism, to talk about big issues, political issues, uh, all sorts of stuff. And they had some critical comments of, a, of what was going on in our Synod in the late 90s, early 2000s, and that got them fired. But they had enough of a support base that they were able to start up their own private program, uh, privately funded. They, our congregation is one of the 300 congregations that gives them thousand dollars a year or so to keep on their uh, ministry and we do get members who find our church because of issues etc oh i was listening to issues etc i became a lutheran through that and wanted to find a church near me that believes and teaches what their program has taught me and we're one of them so uh, we even hosted one of their conferences a long time ago now their conferences are big enough that they have to use like a university lecture hall for their annual conference uh, so that's an excellent program to get on a podcast. It deals with a lot of stuff that we as pastors just can't take up in Bible study. We're not specialized enough. Pastors tend to be generalists. We have general knowledge of a broad variety of topics, theological and, and cultural, but they're going to get on your specialists. Uh, they'll bring on cardinals from the Catholic Church to talk about certain things that affect the Catholic Church. They'll bring on university professors. They'll bring on seminary professors. They'll bring on 
uh, cultural specialists, news media specialists. There's a, an LCMS lady who is a contributor on Fox News, and they've got the connection. They'll bring her on to talk about some things. So they've got connections in it that uh, we in the pastoral local level don't always have. But that and other media sources are a great way to keep growing in your faith as you learn and grow. So with that, let's get into lesson. I don't know what lesson number this actually is. When I saved this last time, it was lesson nine. We're probably at number 10 or 12 or something like that. Anyhow, it's the fifth chief part of the small catechism of Luther. Uh, let's review the last part of baptism, which is going to tie in here. What does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam, that's the phrase for the sinful nature, original sin, it sticks with us. The old Adam in us should, by daily contrition and repentance, be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. So that's what we confess. What do we actually practice in our daily life? Well, it often sounds a little more like, well, once in a blue moon I have contrition and repentance over what I've done wrong, maybe once a year. You know, if I take Ash Wednesday really seriously or Good Friday really seriously, that's a day I really set aside time to be contrite and repentant for my sin. No, it should be daily. That we should daily set aside a little time to reflect on what we've done and left undone and pray God's mercy. So we should daily have contrition and repentance, drown the old Adam, and die with eh, just some of the sins. I've got my pet sins that I really don't want to get rid of. No, it's to drown all sins, all evil desires. That a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. So the baptized life takes place every day through contrition and repentance, and rising in the faith to live before God as a forgiven sinner who strives to do his will. We read Romans 6. Now we're going to get into the fifth chief part that connects that contrition and repentance to an actual formal way that that acts itself out in the church, uh, between the sinner and God, and also between the sinner and and his or her pastor, and why that is. We're going to have a little bit of a discussion even about what is the job of a pastor, and um, a little historical discussion in this one, too, because this is the, the catalyst for the Lutheran Reformation, which then, of course, opened the door to much more of the broader Protestant Reformation. It began on, on this theological issue, even though after this catalyzing event, there were things before it and things after it as well. If you think about the catechism, we've distinguished Lutherans from others during the Ten Commandments, during the Apostles' Creed, during baptism. So it, the Lutheran difference is seen in all the other parts of the catechism. But historically, the first thing that really uh, got the kickstart going was right here in what do you do with a sinner who is afraid of damnation because of his sin? And that's where it starts. So let's look at the small catechisms portion here. The fifth chief part, what is confession? Confession has two parts. First, that we confess our sins. Second, that we receive absolution, that is, forgiveness from the pastor, as from God himself. Not doubting, but firmly believing that by it, by the absolution, our sins are forgiven before God in heaven. What sins should we confess? Before God, we should plead guilty of all sins, even those we are not aware of, as we do in the Lord's Prayer. But before the pastor, we should confess only those sins which we know and feel in our hearts. Which are these? So the pronoun these referring to the ones we know and feel in our hearts. Which are the sins that we should actually know and feel in our hearts and need that uh, comfort and assurance from a pastor that we are forgiven for. Consider your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. Are you a father, mother, son, daughter, husband, wife, or worker? Have you been disobedient, unfaithful, or lazy? Have you been hot-tempered, rude, or quarrelsome? 
Have you hurt someone by your words or deeds? Have you stolen, been negligent, wasted anything, or done any harm? The implication by those questions is that's the kind of stuff that a Christian should actually know and feel in his heart and know and feel it enough that you would actually want to call up your pastor, talk about what you've done, receive the forgiveness of sins, and be encouraged to that new man living a godly life. How often do we not take very seriously our laziness, our hot-temperedness, our quarrelsomeness? All right, so that's, that's, a, that's not saying that those sins are, are light. It's saying that we don't take our sin as seriously as God's word does. Uh, so that's, those three questions are Luther's questions and answers on what is confession. Now, keep in mind, Luther writes the Catechism in 1528, which is 11 years after the Reformation really started. So the next block here is my little historical notes. And then we'll get on the backside. There's a little more in the Catechism uh, on this topic. So. Martin Luther was born in the late 1400s, 1490 or 1484, I believe. 84 or 86. He didn't even know what year he was born, actually. They didn't mark birthdays like we do, so I don't feel so bad about misremembering. Um, he was the son of a miner, and this blue-collar mining guy had actually, his father Hans, had actually risen up to own the mine, which was no small uh, growth in professional terms. He sends his son Martin to become a lawyer and this would serve the family business as well as just be a good profession um, on a trip home from the uh, law school luther is caught in a thunderstorm nearly gets electrocuted by a lightning bolt and in his uh catholic faith which is all there was at the time uh he prays to saint anne who is a fictitious character that the Catholic had made, the Catholics had given names to Mary, Virgin Mary's parents. We don't actually know what their names were. They're not mentioned in scripture anywhere. Uh, so he prays to St. Anne, the mother of the Virgin Mary, uh, promising that if she spares his life, he will become a monk. He does survive, and he enters into the cloister to become a monk, an Augustinian order. So. Even within the Catholic Church at that time and today, different monastic orders had different rule books and different emphases to the point where we would look at them and go, dude, that's like your differences are even bigger than some of our Protestant differences. The difference between an Augustinian and a Benedictine and a Carthusian and all these different monastic orders was pretty pronounced. I mean, they were different enough. And the politics of who's guys eventually got to be pope might even lead to the point where some of them were excommunicated and in a couple of cases even put to death. So those, we look at the reformation of Luther as this, uh, this big change to uh, the world of religion, and it was in many respects, but we also have to acknowledge that before then, and still under the broader umbrella of Catholicism, you have some wide variety. So he enters into the Augustinian order, and that's not unimportant. His theology and Lutheran theology will be very much in line with St. Augustine, a church father from the fourth century. Uh, so that that's, that's a major part of that, which is why I mention it. His, his abbot, an abbot oversees a monastery, his abbot really put him on this path, because his abbot is the person that he would be going to with confession uh, and penance, and eventually his abbot gets tired of hearing his confessions because they're too often and too many, and like I've told you before, before Luther can even get done with his penance, he's angry at God for leveling this on these poor, on us poor miserable sinners who can't do anything about it, and his father, his spiritual father, uh, St John Staupitz, decides that the solution to all of Luther's problems will be to make him study scripture more, because actually they weren't really studying it all that much. So he sends him off to this little podunk town called Wittenberg that just started a university and makes him become a university professor, puts him to work studying and serving as a parish pastor alongside the actual parish priests and pastors that are there in Wittenberg. 
And that's where you find Luther uh, in 1517 when he's challenging the church's sale of indulgences. He's a university professor. He is a doctor of the church now. He wasn't always. He started off as a monk who had some great crises of conscience knowing how can I be right with God? How can I be sure that I will not burn in hell for my sins or spend eternity in purgatory paying for them? How can we find peace with God? Um, and thankfully, his father confessor was tired of him and just sent him off to study God's word more. Because in scripture, he does find his answers. He finds that the medieval theology of the scholastics and that led to this, uh, this system of penance is not true. It's not biblical. Uh, it takes him a little while to get there, uh, but 1517 is the, the key moment in which he writes 95 theses or statements for an academic debate. Again, he's a university professor uh, challenging the sale of indulgences. An indulgence would be uh, making a payment to the church for yourself or for a dead relative who is in purgatory to uh, expedite their way into heaven. Uh, so that's the thing he's challenging. He gives 95 statements, which would be for a debate, and the debate never happens. He's rejected and called to recant, and he doesn't. Um, and instead, he keeps publishing more and more. So let's look at quickly at the Roman church's teaching that Luther had been taught in and brought up in. Uh, I didn't bring my Catholic catechism. Usually I grab that and bring it in, but this is coming straight from their Catechism of the Catholic Church, still in use today, confession has three parts. Contrition, which means feeling guilty for your sins. We include that, but not in the first portion. Right? If you look at the three questions above, there is something said about feeling it in our hearts. But it's not the first step in the confession. We'll come back to it. So, contrition, feeling guilty of your sins. Confession, and they do specify the confession of all sins. If you do not confess it, they cannot prescribe the penance, the satisfaction for it, and those are the ones you pay for in purgatory. So confession is not just a general, I plead guilty of all sins, even those I'm not aware of. Right? That's Luther 11 years later saying, before God, we plead guilty of all sins, even those we can't know. Uh, the Lutherans often quoted from Psalm 50, uh, o oh Lord, who can discern his errors? There's just no way we could possibly know all our sins. So we, we believe what God's word says and we confess we're guilty of them, but there's no way we can confess all of them. The Catholic Catechism of the Church requires a confession of all sins. And the priests actually had manuals to effect that, to make that happen. They had uh, confessor manuals as basically manuals on interrogation in helping the, the penitent go deeper and deeper into the sin. So it wouldn't just be, um, I mean, the, the questions were such that they got into the realm of uh, what you do with your wife, in, down to the very positions that are used, and the pleasure behind it, and the thoughts, I mean, they are going deeply, deeply, deeply into the act of, marital lovemaking, to root out all sin that could be underneath. These are interrogation manuals that they would have in there. So when Luther and the Lutherans talk about confession under the Catholic system being a torture, they're not exaggerating. That's not uh, just pejorative straw manning. There's books telling them how to do this for the purpose of ascribing the right amount of penance and the proper penance to make up for it, because if not, you're paying for it in purgatory. So that second one is, a, it sounds the same, right? We say first that we confess our sins, they say second after contrition is confession of sins. There's a whole different ball game going on there in how much you confess, what you confess, what is the priest's response when you confess? Is it to dig deeper or is it to shed the light of God's word on that sin and on God's forgiveness for that sin. The third part here is the one that gets the most attention, the most obvious different part. Satisfaction is not the same thing as absolution. Absolution is a word for cleansing, for wiping away. Satisfaction is also called penance, satisfying God's penalty for this. 
Uh, so the, the second point down there, they do separate in the Catholic system, they separate guilt from consequences. The priest can absolve your guilt over the sin, but you still owe a penalty to God. They compare it to, well, ob something that we would actually agree with. If you steal somebody's bike and you are contrite and confessing that it was wrong that you stole this person's bike, you should give the bike back. Right? We agree with that. They would say, well, you've also stolen something from God, and how do you pay back that to God? Apparently not by giving the bike back to the neighbor you took it from, but by praying ten Hail Marys, or eleven Our Fathers, or whatever is prescribed. And of course, undergirding that for us is there's no system of purgatory. It's just this is the fruit of faith. This is what God's word would have you do. For them, it is, if you don't do this now, you will have to do it in the afterlife because They've created a hole in their system of works versus salvation. There's a hole. They would acknowledge what you've done is not bad enough that you should go to hell, but you also can't go to heaven because this has been unremitted, unsatisfied. So there must, this is deduction working, you mu there must be another place in, in the middle where these things are then satisfied, purged, and purgatory. They're purged. So it's the... The, the fire of hell would be the fire of destruction. The fire of purgatory would be the fire of cleansing. Right? So you're not getting destroyed. You're just getting cleansed, purged of the sin that goes with you that wasn't paid for in this life. So that's the, the realm of what confession is in Luther's time. And for a little while before that, none of that is indulgences. Indulgences gets added as a workaround of the penance. Right, so the satisfaction or penance were actual works to be done, typically in the form of prayer, and the buying of an indulgence as a way around that. Even many Catholic theologians from that time were saying, come on, this sounds like a very cheap way to get out of penance, to get out of sacrifice. Um, and so that initially was one of Luther's big problems with it, too. It's like, yeah, this isn't penance. People who buy indulgences aren't repentant. They're thinking, hey, I can pay a fine and get off scot-free. That's wrong. Uh, so that's the initial objection there. And where that's where indulgences fit in. Still to this day, they are offered. You can buy them. You can get them from the diocese. Uh, periodically on special anniversaries, they, the popes will once again offer special plenary indulgences. There was one being offered when I was in seminary. I forget what the occasion was. But they're still out there. This has never been recanted. It's never been changed. Uh, so the first point there that I skipped over is still important here. The, there is a distinction made between mortal sins and venial sins. Mortal sins automatically damn. You can come back from them. You can repent and make your way back in. But if you were to die before that, you're in hell. You've fallen from the state of grace. Venial sins are deemed less severe and those are the ones that you're paying for in purgatory if you don't repent of them, right? If you don't carry the, uh, go confess them, receive the penance, and finish all the penance, it's those venial ones. So they do have a distinction between mortal and venial. Lutherans do also distinguish and talk about mortal and venial, but it's very different. It's, a, it's almost flipped around. The most deadly sins are not the big grandiose ones like an affair or murder where even the government is punishing you and everybody's telling you you're wrong, the most deadly and dangerous sins are the little ones that we stop caring about, are the ones that become habits, that overtake our identity even. Those are the most dangerous ones uh, because we do not listen to God's word and they can slowly harden our hearts. Uh, how many gossips grow hardened in their heart, cold towards their neighbor, and have no repentance at all for it. Or typically, sins against the first table of the law, right? Attending worship, pure doctrine, honoring God above all things. Those are the ones that just you slow burn or you slow boil yourself into. Uh, so Lutherans will distinguish sins. We'll talk a little bit about that too. But... Uh, that's, that distinction between mortal and venial is part of the theological error that led to this need for a purgatory and the penance that solves the dilemma of where do you go. 
Um, so on October 31st, which is the eve of All Saints Day, uh, All Hallows' Eve, this Augustinian friar named Reverend Dr. Martin Luther posts 95 theses challenging that sale, and that's the start of the Reformation. Um, things went slowly from there. And if you get one of the Luther movies, there was one from about 10 years ago, then there was one back in like the 50s where the actor actually got an Academy Award for it. I actually like that movie better. Um, the movies obviously make it seem like it all happens within you know, a two hour movie, but it takes decades. Uh, it takes decades. Even after Luther's lifetime, there's still work getting done. Um, the Council of Trent is where the Catholic Church finally responded to the Lutheran errors. They didn't invite the Lutherans to participate, and that, that council itself took almost a decade to really define and clarify. And that's really where you take the earlier divisions, since Catholicism was very divided, and at least now there's a standard. In this way, we would say that the Lutheran confession of the faith which begins with the catechisms, but includes the Augsburg Confession of 1530, where we were called before the emperor to actually deliver what we believe. Our confession of the faith predates the Catholic churches because they never actually sat down and defined it that narrowly until Trent, which is a decade and a half after our confession was on the table. So in some ways, the Lutheran church is an older confession than Catholicism because Catholicism's first real confession is Trent. And it's there that they say, anyone who says you are saved by faith is anathema, cursed or damned. That's still their official teaching. Right? Tridentine Catholicism is still the official teaching of their church. They've never had a council that revoked any of that. They've had other councils, but those addressed with other issues and, and things within the history of the world. So that is their defining moment much later on. They did not retract these things. They cleaned up some of the moral failures that were being criticized across the world. Um, they had priest scandals back then too. There were popes who were married. There were popes who were made pope when they weren't even a priest yet. Uh, politics mattered then too. So there were a lot of things that they did need to clean up from a moral side. Uh, some of those things they cleaned up then, but they didn't fix the theological problems of salvation by grace, not by works. Uh, the role of baptism the relation of law and gospel. I mean, the key fundamental things they didn't fix, they doubled down and standardized. So that now even an Augustinian order, which had always, you know, Augustine had been teaching in the fourth century that we're saved by grace, not by works. I mean, that half of the Lutheran confessions is showing that our teaching is not new to the, to the 1500s, but this is what church fathers, plural, many of them have said since the beginning. And it's what scripture says. So that in, at Trent is when those opinions, which some orders held, were now no longer allowable. So. Yeah. Not, not that you wouldn't be aware of them or think of them as sins. It's that we don't take them seriously, so we start, we stop feeling guilty. Think of, you know, a child at second grade or whatever lies to his parents, succeeds, and feels so guilty that he tells them. Right? The guilt was eating the child alive to the point where he actually did confess. As they get into their teenage years and their and their high school and then college, and they start getting away with lying more and more, they stop feeling bad about it. Right, and that's where their their conscience grows cold or seared. Uh, the same could be true with any number of sins. Right, that maybe the child isn't having, uh, obviously, the high school student isn't having sex before marriage, but you know, the first time they get a dirty magazine or now it's on the computer, they feel terribly guilty about it. How long does it take before they no longer even feel guilty about it? But it's become an addiction, an obsession, and Maybe they're even disagreeing with God or rejecting their church and saying, no, there's nothing wrong with this. I'm done with the church that says that sexual sins actually matter. So that's what I'm that's where I'm getting at with venial sins uh, 
don't have the same level of consequences as the mortal ones where, yeah, you commit an affair, you're in trouble. And so we stop seeing the consequences. We stop thinking that it's all that serious. And I mean, we're all adults. We recognize that we don't feel as bad about certain things that we used to as children. Even like the, the, the laziness angle. Right? You come home with a bad grade to your parents for the first time and you had that, well, if it was laziness, you should. Um, but how much of us now are really thinking about how we rob from our bosses if we take an extra 15 minutes on our break than we're supposed to have? That's laziness, is it not? Um, so that's where, where we would talk about the venial sins making our conscience grow dull because no one's telling us it's wrong and there is no punishment for it. And unless God starts zapping people with lightning bolts, we're not going to take it very seriously. Uh, the example Paul uses in I think, 2 Corinthians 5 when he's talking about numerous Old Testament examples of plagues and destruction brought on the people for sins. Some of them are idolatry, like he'll use the golden calf example. Uh, another is for adultery. But then he gets to one where it's like, they grumbled against Moses, and a thousand dropped in a single day. Okay. It would be self-serving as a pastor to go into like a, a congregational voters meeting and say, okay, let's read the story about grumbling against Moses and a thousand dropping dead. But that's just it. Churches haven't seen a thousand people drop dead for grumbling against their pastor in how long, so they stop thinking it's serious. They don't even give a second thought to it, let alone feel guilty about it, and they keep going. And at what point do they now no longer even listen to the gospel that their pastor is preaching? Right? That's, that's an example of how the, the so-called small venial sins really do harden and threaten uh, the soul. You don't need a very detailed manual. You've got what, what the small catechism just taught you to say, right? Examine your place in life according to the Ten Commandments. You're a husband. You're a father. You're a worker. You have husband, father, worker sins. Have you been hot-tempered, rude, quarrelsome? So you ask yourself these questions frequently enough, and you'll start identifying, well, I've done those. Why don't I feel bad about those? And then you do it. Then you start actually thinking about it the way you should, which is, have I allowed my conscience to grow a little cold? Have I become too puffed up and thinking I'm better than I am? Have I gotten too secure in my sins? Uh, one of the great prayers you could pray is, you know, oh, Lord, trouble me. Make me worried about my sin if I'm not. Uh, that way we do avoid the, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, rejecting his work of calling us to repentance, that we don't want to grow cold. You know, why have I grown cold? Why hasn't this bothered me the same way? Uh, and so we encourage that to become a daily practice, right? That's why I had that baptism section at the top. Daily contrition and repentance, daily emerging and arising. So make it a practice to daily think about your sin, to think about the Ten Commandments, to... Uh, think about how we've wronged God by what we've done and what we've left undone. And typically what happens is we grow in our awareness of our sin. We don't grow cold then. It's when we don't practice that at all that it starts to, that our, our flesh starts to grow a hard, stony exterior to the word of God's accusations. His arrows are supposed to pierce us. That's one of the images that comes up often in the penitential Psalms. Your arrows have sunk into me. Well, that happens when we do actually heed the word of God, when we listen to it. When we don't, when you start reading this, the penitential psalms and you're like, okay, I haven't soaked my bed with tears in a long time, or my bones ache within me. When was the last time my guilt had that level of effect on me? It's a, it's a, it's a spiritual check-in, right? If you go to your dentist twice a year, you get a physical once a year, maybe you should go to confession with your pastor at least once or twice a year to really confess your sin and take it to heart, prepare for it, read those, uh, reread the Ten Commandments with their meanings, think honestly about what you've done and left undone. Uh, we encourage that every week as you come to church. 
every week in our bulletin, we publish a different section of the catechism called Christian Questions with Their Answers. And it's a good review of what does it mean to be a Christian? How should I be looking at myself and my life and the world around me? Uh, so there, there are diagnost diagnostic tools, so to speak, and the lack of feeling is one of the warning signs. Uh, for instance, in those questions that Luther asks those who are preparing for the sacrament, what should you do if you don't have a hunger or thirst or a want to go to the sacrament of the altar? His first one is pinch yourself, see if you're still alive, and then believe what scripture says about your sinful flesh. Second, look around at the world around you and believe what scripture says about the world, which is you are going to have trouble. Third, know that the devil is always around us, who with his murdering and prowling day and night will not let us have any rest within or without. So he, he goes through this whole list of, okay, check yourself, check the world, remember what scripture says about your flesh, the world, and the devil, and you will be hungry for this aid, for this uh, sacramental help. Same thing with confession and absolution. If you don't think that you're actually all that sinful, you better check yourself. So let's get back to the, the confession part from uh, confession. So this is the bottom of the history section. Now taking the, the catechism portion of Luther and reinserting it in its context. So confession has two parts, not three. Confessing sin and receiving absolution. So who's active, who's passive there? We confess our sin. We receive something else. That's the passive part. Right? So first I confess my sin, and then a pastor proclaims God's forgiveness for that sin and for all sin, and I receive it. Uh, the way we think of mortal and venial is often backwards. Even if guilt and consequences are distinguished, the death of Christ covers both, and Scripture is very clear on that. Uh, acts of penance are, by definition, contradictory to quote-unquote good works because they are done out of obligation and self-benefit instead of freely and for the benefit of the neighbor, right? So the, the idea of these good works, not just the, the acts of penance, such as prayers that must be said, but even the idea that your good works would outweigh your bad ceases to be good in an altruistic sense if you're doing it for yourself. This is just on the surface backwards. Those good works should be done, and Lutherans do encourage and require good works. We say good works are necessary, not to earn your salvation. They are necessary because God's commanded them, and the new man will want to do them, and they're necessary because your neighbor needs them. They're necessary for your neighbor. But if you're doing them for yourself, that is on the surface, self-serving, not altruistic. Uh, so this is how so, this is just a brief little look at how Lutherans do talk about good works uh, and their place in the Christian life. Now let's flip the page. A little more living color on this confession and absolution. It wasn't in the, the original first edition of the small catechism, but within Luther's lifetime, they added the, these next three questions to the, the small catechism. It's called the Office of the Keys. The, what is the Office of the Keys? The Office of the Keys is that special authority which Christ has given to his church on earth to forgive the sins of repentant sinners, but to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. We'll get to the where is this written. It's the third one of what I've written here. The language of keys actually comes from Matthew 16, where Jesus says to Peter, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whoever sins you re retain, they are retained. He, Jesus then extends that to all the twelve and... Matthew 18, saying basically the same thing. Uh, whoever sins you bind, they are bound. Whoever sins you loose, they are loosed. And then John 20 is the, the main one that we quote here in the Catechism, because it's on resurrection evening. And it's very clear. Uh, so this is, this is, these are the passages where we get the language of keys and also the institution of an office a functioning office within the church that is to do this. 
He's giving his apostles a job to do. So John 20, where is this written? This is what St. John the Evangelist writes in chapter 20. The Lord Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. All right, real, and more than just those two verses, there's even more in that section that, that shows we're talking about a, what, we, what we call the office of the ministry or the office of pastors. Uh, Jesus goes on to say, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Um, at an ordination of a pastor, we read the longer section. But just for the focus on an office where sins are either bound or forgiven, it's clear in Scripture. Jesus has given his church through their public ministers to do this, to forgive and to not forgive. Um, the first question made it very clear. Who are they to forgive? Repentant sinners. Who are they not to forgive? The unrepentant. There are only two types of sinners. Penitent and impenitent, or their synonyms, repentant and unrepentant. Everyone is a sinner. That is what we believe and confess. Right? Just like we learned in the Ten Commandments, I am a sinner, therefore I sin. And that applies to every human being. The question is whether it is a repentant sinner or an unrepentant sinner. And in practice, we would even maybe add a, an adverb here. Who does the pastor not forgive? An openly unrepentant sinner. Because repentance and unrepentance isn't something that's externally visible, like blue eyes or brown eyes, blonde hair or brown hair. No, repentance is something that is invisible in the heart. It's expressed. So when it comes to confession and absolution, I don't assume that somebody who's coming to me and repentant is secretly unrepentant. I know you're saying that you're repentant, but I believe you're not. That would be pretty hard to establish. The only exception or the, the case where that would be is if the person is refusing to actually bear fruit of repentance, right? They stole the bike and they're saying, well, no, I'm not giving it back. Okay, then are you repentant? If you've told me that you believe this is wrong and you've sinned against God by taking your neighbor's bike and you sinned against your neighbor by taking his bike and you recognize this is wrong and contrary to God's word, why don't you want to give the bike back? How are you still repentant? Right, so that would be the, the limit of the questioning that a pastor would do with somebody who is confessing their sins. Uh, typically, the only ones who are bound in their sins, as far as not receiving forgiveness, are the openly unrepentant. Those who say, no, this is not sin and I will not repent. Uh, sadly, we in the church do run into that sometimes. Things that we run into, especially in the sixth commandment, uh, when it comes to people living together before marriage, and we tell them, well, God would have you either be married first or stay apart until you are married. And sometimes they will say, no, we're not going to stop doing this. We don't think God's word is right on this. Well, I'm not allowed to speak my own opinion. I speak what God's word says. There's marriage and there's not marriage. Which are you in? Sex belongs in marriage, not in not marriage. So, where there is repentance for that, we forgive. And the fruit of that repentance is often you get married. So there is repentance. So the same sin could be handled differently by a repentant versus an unrepentant. And typically we're dealing with openly unrepentant, someone who is openly saying, I no longer care what God's word says about this. I'm doing my way. I'm continuing with my choice. Uh, so that's the difference here under the office of the keys. We forgive the repentant sinners. We withhold forgiveness from the openly unrepentant as long as they do not repent. They can always repent. We want them to repent. We pray for them to repent. Even in 1 Corinthians 5, where Paul teaches most clearly on excommunication, it is with the goal of repentance. That withholding communion from someone because of their unrepentance is so they will see how serious their sin is. And so other Christians will see how serious that sin is and not, as Paul says, let a little leaven leaven the whole lump, right? Even my eighth graders know this, as I used in the example with them the other day. If, if one student turns around and socks the other in the face and I don't rebuke it, 
What do they all think? Must be okay now. And soon they're all punching each other in the face. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. In open public sin that does not get rebuked, or for which someone is unrepentant, but then still receives communion and all the, all the life of the church benefits, then everybody is soon doing it. So it, it bears, both a, bears both on the individual's life, that they be repentant, and for the sake of the, the Christian community, that repentance be real and that we be in good order with each other. Um, so that's where, in Paul's case, in 1 Corinthians 5, the, the person is called to repentance, they're excommunicated, and the person actually does repent. That's why 2 Corinthians is written the way it is and has so much about reconciliation, because the person who was rebuked did repent and is now being welcomed back into the congregation in Corinth. So we talked about the two different types of sinners. There are a couple different ways we do distinguish sin or sins besides the mortal and venial. There is a difference between how we handle public sins and private sins. By definition, public sins everybody knows about. Private sins, how am I supposed to know about it? Unless it's confessed to me and it's still private, in which case we keep it private. Uh, in the same way with a, a fellow Christian. If a fellow Christian confides in you of a sin they're struggling with, it's private. You don't make it public. But when a, if a pastor or a church knows of a public sin, it has to be rebuked publicly. It's not a matter of uh, the Eighth Commandment. Public sin, especially if it's false teaching, requires public rebuke. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Private sins are private, and usually they're kept private out of a good, healthy type of shame, right? That we are guilty, and we don't want people to know about this. We want to deal with it, so we don't make it public. It could be the same sin, but in a public case, somebody's flaunting it. In a private case, the person is still struggling with it. So we deal with those differently, and that's reflected in the, we forgive the sins of repentant sinners. We withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. And that's typically when it becomes public, and you read through you know, how Matthew 18 outlines that you go to somebody privately, personally, if they've sinned against you, if they refuse to repent, you bring one or two neutral parties, witnesses to hear both sides, and if the person doesn't listen to them, then you bring it to the church, right? So then it becomes more public because what's been done is not repented of. Uh, often in our day and age, it doesn't come to that because there's a billion churches around here and somebody gets into a argument with somebody else, they don't actually try to reconcile. They just say, well, fine, I'm going to another church. So there's no reconciliation, there's no forgiveness, and that's not good. That's not healthy for either party. Another sin difference that we have in scripture even, sins of ignorance versus willful sins. Even in the Old Testament, there was a different sacrifice for sins of ignorance when somebody did not know what they were doing was wrong. Yeah, you treat that differently than somebody who knows what they're doing is wrong and chooses to do it. Even scripture deals with those differently. Uh, so we too respect that, that that could be different. You'll meet some couples who are cohabiting before marriage who did not know it was wrong. So you deal with them differently than a couple that does know it's wrong, hears you tell them it's wrong, and still disagrees with you and says they're gonna keep on doing it. Different couples, right? Different cases. Uh, different as that bears upon how the keys are going to be administered. The, the next big danger with willful sins is that they can also often become sins against conscience. Or what we would call hard-hearted sins. Hard-hearted sins. Uh, a sin against conscience is now not just the action, but... I'm done listening to the Holy Spirit on this. I'm done listening to my pastor about this. I know scripture or my pastor says this is wrong. I don't care anymore. See, we will often know something's wrong and still do it. And we'll know it's wrong and we'll regret it later. Sins against conscience is where we stop regretting it. And we determine to keep on doing it. Uh, that's when those become those identity sins. Or this is who I am now. Distinguished from both of those 
are what we often call sins of weakness. And in that category, you're often dealing with addictive sins, habitual sins, uh, sins where the person committing it does not want to keep doing it, but they find themselves in their human flesh physically unable to stop alcoholism. Like I said, addictions. Most addictions typically fall under this, where the person himself hates it, does not want it. He's not, he's not a hard heart, he's not hard hearted and impenitent. He hates it and wants to break free of it. And due to weakness of our human nature, can't get out. Right? So there, there is a difference. It may it looks very similar, right? A sin is constantly repeated. But the difference is night and day. One decides, I'm not feeling bad about this. There's nothing wrong with this. The other totally gets that this is wrong and just doesn't see a way out of getting help. Um, so take, for instance, something like uh, depression. Depression itself, as a condition, may produce thoughts, words, or even actions that are sinful. Is that proceeding from a willful disregard of God's word, or is it proceeding from a mental condition that needs help and is a genuine weakness? Often the latter. Right? And so this is why the for, the for the generations that the church whole cloth, broad brush swept all suicides into condemned, we're missing a big a big difference, right? The difference between Judas, Judas Iscariot, who hard-heartedly betrayed Christ, despaired of God's mercy, and hung himself out of remorse, versus people who have illness, weakness. And that weakness may, may have prompted them to do something that is sinful, to take their own life. But that is proceeding from a very different heart, a heart that is often still penitent. Even if their last action wasn't penitent, it's not about what the last action was, because it's not about works, right? Their heart is a penitent heart that looks to Christ, even if their last action was one that is contradictory to that. Just like you could be driving in a car, find yourself in a car accident, your last thought is, you know, some choice words that would fall under breaking both the second and the eighth commandment. It's not about what your last deed was and having the chance to do the right work to make up for it. Confession and repentance are not our works. And so, too, when we think about something like suicide, it's not that their last deed was sinful or sinful enough and they didn't have the next last deed of repentance to make up for it. Ultimately, it comes down to a question of the heart. Is, are they doing what they're doing out of complete hard-hearted rejection of the gospel? Uh, that may be the end result. Somebody like Ernest Hemingway, total atheist, becomes nihilistic in his mindset, despairs of all life and goodness, kills himself. The course of action that led up to the suicide with the unbelief and the hardening of the heart against the goodness of God, that's what done it. What done it. For somebody who is struggling with depression, doesn't want to be depressed, but is struggling with it, and knows that their thoughts are not always correct, wants help, hasn't found it for any number of reasons, that's a very different end result. Right? That's a very different heart at work. So it is important that we do distinguish sins as well as type of sinners. Um, especially for how we in the church handle things like confession and absolution, who we commune, who we ask not to commune, and in some cases, whose funerals we'll do and whose we won't. You know, that's All that plays into this. And like I said, for many, many hundreds of years, it was just a simple no on any suicide when it came to funerals. Now it's not so, now we wouldn't take it that strictly, right? Like in the case of Ernest Hemingway, there's a lot that led up to it. Somebody who has completely left the church, yeah, they're not getting a Christian funeral. They've left the church, regardless of how their life ends. Uh, they've severed themselves from Christ. Questions on that?
Very, very good. Thank you. Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. How do fellow Christians deal with, handle, react to other sinners? One, if the sinner has sinned against you, it is required that you guys work for reconciliation. Right? Matthew 18 is very clear about that. It's not, let's be clear, we're not just saying that only, the sin is only between you and God or you and your pastor if you choose to share it with them. Your sin involves whoever you've sinned against or who sinned against you. Your sin involves any witnesses to your sin. Uh, this is especially true in our own families, where maybe you didn't sin against your wife or children, but your sinful actions are influencing your wife and children. They're learning it from you. Uh, your fellow Christian brothers, sisters, all that does affect them. And so the the giving this to the church, remember, so that's the first question here. The office of the keys is the special authority which Christ has given to the church on earth to forgive sins. We locate that in a particular office in specific cases. You all need to know who you can come bring your sin to and know that you will hear forgiveness. But it belongs also to the church. And as much as you are fellow Christians, if you see a, sin, a fellow Christian who is in sin, Scripture is replete with admonitions to, with, with uh, instruction to admonish one another, right? to rebuke one another with Scripture, to correct one another with Scripture, because ultimately that that is the uh, the calling we have to call sinners to repentance, to proclaim Christ's forgiveness to them. Uh, for example, if you saw a house on fire and somebody's inside, you're not saying, "Well, I'm not the fire department." Typically, you're trying to see if you can get a, get the guy out of there. Usually, I use the fall through ice example, but you know, I, with your husband out ice fishing, Grant, uh, I, I don't want to use that example, but like, okay, you see somebody fall through the ice, you're doing everything you can to get them out right away. If somebody's in a burning building, you do what you can to get them out right away. And Christians who see each other caught in sin have that responsibility. Thanks to social media, we are all well more aware of what our, people, our fellow people are doing in their lives than we probably need to. Uh, so what we, we as Christians would say, you don't go hunting for it. Right? You're not trying to find your neighbor's sins to gouge them out and get them up to, 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 uh, to the surface. But when it's apparent, you can't pretend like you didn't see it. You can't pretend like they didn't say what they said to you or that you didn't witness them do something that's going to harm their their marriage or their faith, you have you have a responsibility as a Christian to admonish your brothers and sisters in Christ. This is especially true in families, and you get this as parents. You're the you're you not me is the primary person to rebuke your children for sin and to proclaim God's forgiveness to them. I can do that in a capacity here at school. Our teachers may, but our teachers may do that also in their classrooms, rebuking sin teaching them to forgive one another for Christ has forgiven them. If it's really serious, then, you know, then they feel they need the pastor also. I've had that, right? Where the teacher has done the rebuking and the and the, the re-encouraging that they're forgiven and the kids still feel so bad that they send them down to my office. They send them to the principal's office for discipline. They send them to the pastor's office for encouragement. That's kind of nice. Uh, just a, a, a factor of having a Christian school. Yeah. Hey, admonishing is just to tell them what you've done is wrong. Right? You need to repent of this. Maybe even taking them where in Scripture it says that if they're not sure, which the Ten Commandments is a helpful one. So, you know, your son James punches his brother in the face. That's wrong. You do not do that. You don't do that again. That's admonishment. Right? That's admonition. You're telling him what not to do or what to do. And if he says, well, why not? What's the Fifth Commandment? You shall not murder. What does this mean? You should not hurt or harm. We should fear and love God so that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body. What did you just do to your brother? I hurt him. Right? So it's showing them that what they've done violates God's law and that they should repent. 
and then actually encouraging them, right? So admonition leads to encouragement. As parents and our teachers will do this too, there are still consequences. Not eternal, right? These are not before God as if it's some sort of system of penance where you have to earn God's salvation. So for parents and teachers, you have to be abundantly clear, you know, I do still love you. God forgives you. Uh, you are precious and loved in his sight. There are still consequences, repercussions for the action you've done. But also telling them that as parents, you're doing that because you love them and you want them to learn from this. Uh, and you want them to not make the same mistake again before it gets e before it hurts them even worse. Right? So if my mom spanked me for playing in the street right after she told me not to, then she was also going to be very clear with me that I'm doing this little bit of pain so that you don't get hit by a car the next time you don't listen to what I just told you to do. Right? So that's where parenting has to be very explicit in the Christian, the consequences we have and how this is actually love, right? The discipline is love. The chastising is love. Uh, as we, so yeah, as we as Christians live together, we do have to call each other to account. And maybe the reconciliation does need to incorporate the pastor because if it's not just a neutral, I witnessed you do something, but I'm the one you sinned against, it can become very easy for both sides to become defensive and not actually get to the reconciliation. So sometimes you do need to bring in a pastor or another neutral Christian party to get to the heart of it. Yeah. Um, let's see. The third and final question under that office of the keys will, will get to the specific office of the pastor and why you have that. When you can and should admonish one another, rebuke one another for sin, forgive one another when it's repented of. Why do you have a pastor then? Well, what do you believe according to these words? I, that, I believe that when the called ministers of Christ deal with us by his divine command, so it's Christ's command to forgive sins, in particular when they exclude openly unrepentant sinners from the Christian congregation, there's that openly unrepentant, and absolve those who repent of their sins and want to do better, this is just as valid and certain, even in heaven, as if Christ our dear Lord dealt with us himself. So the purpose for God giving the church pastors and for the church knowing that they have a man put into an office that Christ has commanded to proclaim forgiveness of sins is for your comfort. Right? God doesn't... Uh, God does not put pastors in the church for the benefit of the pastor. He puts pastors in the church for the benefit of the church. And he doesn't put a pastor in the church uh, so that God can be certain. God is certain enough of Christ's sacrifice for sin. God puts pastors in the church for the certainty of the Christian who would be doubting. Right? Even in the first section on the front side, um, what is confession? First, we confess our sins. Second, we receive absolution from the pastor as from God himself, not doubting. Not doubting. Right? The, God gives you a pastor to hear exactly what you've done wrong and proclaim forgiveness for that sin so that you will not doubt. It's not for my benefit or his benefit. It's for your benefit that you not doubt that God forgives you. For Luther, in his time... He was always doubting whether God loved him or whether his penance was enough to make him right with God. It may not be for the same reasons, but sinners today still deal with doubt. On their deathbed, especially. What will I say? What will happen when I actually have to face God and the sins that I've hidden for 10, 20, 50 years are no longer hidden? They've never been hidden. God has always known them, but now I can't deny it or hide from it anymore. I'm appearing before God. That's when you want to know for certain and not doubt. So God has given you pastors to proclaim that, to make that sure and certain. And he even gives them the order, the command to forgive the sins of repentance. I do not have the authority to withhold forgiveness from repentant sinners. I don't have that authority. God's command is to forgive the repentant sinners and to withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant. So the flip side is also true. I don't have the authority to give the forgiveness of sins to an unrepentant. This is why I can't 
in good conscience, perform the wedding of some people who are not repentant and prepared to be married. Right? This is why we have to not give communion to people who are unrepentant as long as they don't repent. I don't have the authority to do that. It's not up to me. This is Christ's command and office. Forgive the repentant, withhold forgiveness from the unrepentant as long as they do not repent. Once they repent, boom, forgiveness, sacraments, whole life of the church, restored. That's our commands, our marching orders. The benefit of that for the church is that, one, you know who to go to with your sin. Two, the church puts their pastors under additional vows or orders not to reveal anything confessed to us. And we hold that to the point where if a pastor ever did reveal what was confessed to him, he's removed from office. The trust has been broken. Uh, and then third, the, the public nature of this insofar as the, the church has a guy that we all know who we go to. That's important. Obviously, yes, if, if you've committed a sin and Jonathan witnessed it, he should rebuke you, he should correct you, and if you, would, and if you repent, he should proclaim God's forgiveness. Okay, God has forgiven you. Go in peace. Let's go to the Lord's altar together and commune. Right? We should do that. If you doubt, though, and he's already told you this, who should you go to next? the person who's been called and ordained to proclaim this, uh, to do this. So it's always directed towards giving the Christian confidence and certainty of the comfort we have in Christ. Uh, and that's, you know, so to speak, a full-time job, right? I'd like to say it's not a job. The church provides a living to their pastors so they don't have to get a real job. Because if I had a real job, I couldn't make it to the hospital at any hour of the day when someone is worried about, okay, pastor, I thought I was okay, but I'm going into surgery and I'm kind of nervous. So we go and we pray and we offer confession and absolution and we bring the sacrament if we're able. Uh, I've been to deathbeds in the middle of the night for several hours to sit with people as they die, to hear their confession, to give them communion, to be with their family. I can't do that if I've got to get up and go to a nine to five job doing whatever else I would have gotten to do. And that happens often enough, right? In this case, we also have a school, so we've got some teaching capacity that we pastors can do. We study the word, we prepare for sermons. Our whole job is focused around the means of grace, whether that's in the form of confession and absolution or teaching or preaching, baptizing, burying, as we have a funeral today, or any of the pastoral tasks that we're given to do, that we're charged with in our ordination, it's for the sake of the church to know who you go to, who do you call, if it had to be only the brotherhood of fellow Christians, you're going to say, well, I can't bother him, he's, got, he's working. And he might not be able to take the call, he certainly can't just leave work and come meet with you. I remember once uh, when I was in Iowa, um, it was my off day, uh, which is typically Friday, that I take off and don't do church work, but take care of housework. Um, I got a phone call from the son of a member who said, you know, hospice was just in. They think dad's got less than 24 hours. He seems really upset. Can you come over? Of course, dropped everything, went right over, uh, visited with him and his wife had the whole, what we call, in Catholic terms, they call it the last rites. We would call it the commendation of the dying, where you commend them to God, you do confession and absolution, you have the Lord's Supper, you teach and prepare them for what's about to happen. And after I left, later that night, he did die. It was his last day. Very often we hear, oh, last six hours, then last six days or months even. Uh, but that time it really was the last day. Uh, and his, his son thanked me, saying that before that he couldn't figure out, but his dad was just so anxious and worked up and just not at peace. He, he, it was terminal cancer, but he just he wasn't at peace. He said, after you left, I don't know what you said or what you guys had done, but he was at peace. And he said, well, we had confession and absolution. He had stuff to get off his chest. We had confession, absolution, we had the sacrament, we had a little service in his house. 
that's, that's part of why we do what we do, so that when you actually go to face God, you are prepared to go to your death just as peacefully as you come to communion. Because when you understand communion is actually receiving the body and blood of Christ, appearing before God uh, by faith, not by sight, and you prepare yourself for that with repentance, with confession and absolution, with the faithful belief that I am receiving his body and blood for the forgiveness of my sins as a pledge and a token of the salvation he has won for me, you can go to your death with that at peace. And so when death approaches, especially in cases where people nearing the end can't make it to church very often, they want to call the pastor and they need to call the pastor. And they, we need to teach our young people to call the pastor for their parents or grandparents or whatever stage they're in because of the effect it has, uh, that people still do fear death and are uncertain about what comes after it and want that consolation. Uh, and that's why it's there. So since we're on the topic of pastor, let's get to the bottom half here, the office of pastor. The first three terms here are definitions that I borrowed from our, uh, our textbook that we use with our seventh and eighth graders. The holy ministry is the preaching and teaching office of the gospel and sacraments of Christ through which the Holy Spirit creates, sustains, and nurtures faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. The divine call, uh, the call from God through the church to a man to be a public minister of the gospel, that is, the authority to preach and teach the word of God and administer the sacraments in the stead of Christ. Uh, so when we talk about this, this call, or the divine call, and you hear this in the Sunday liturgy, I as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority forgive you all of your sins, what we as Lutherans would say about that calling is it's not that the internal sense of purpose, like I want to become a pastor, so I go to college and seminary and prepare for it. That inner sense, yeah, we can talk about that as a calling, but you aren't called yet by the church, right? By God through the church happens when the church calls you. When the church actually issues you a call, now you are a called pastor. Uh, as it often happens every single year, there are guys who fail out of seminary academically. They're not cut out for it. Sometimes morally, they're not cut out for it or behaviorally or whatever the case is. They came with that inner sense of this is what I should do. But for one reason or many, the church does not call them. God does not call them through the church into this office. Uh, in other churches, this, under, this teaching of what is the call is completely internal. The question then is, who gets to verify that or how can it be verified? And in the frontier days of the United States, this happened very often that some, some guy on horseback would show up in a town and just claim that God told him to be their pastor. Especially if they knew that there was a vacancy. Good way for a, a con artist to get a good job. And so in our Lutheran teaching, it's not that. It's not this enthusiastic internal call, sense of calling, which nobody can question. There's actually like a legitimate process at work. Uh, in the Lutheran tradition, it's always involved four parts. Uh, education, examination by the seminary professors or the pastoral councils or whatever. There's always an examination. Is, is this guy actually equipped and prepared to do what's required of a pastor? The call of a congregation and the actual rite of ordination. Uh, so that's the next term, the ordination. Uh, the, quote, holy orders or solemn charge given to the man being placed into the office of the holy ministry to tend, keep, and defend the holy gospel of Christ and his congregation through the faithful preaching and teaching of the word of God, judging doctrine, remitting and retaining sin, there's your office of the keys language, and administering the sacraments of Christ according to his institution. So now if a sneak preacher came riding into horseback into town and went up to a Lutheran church, the Lutheran church would say, where did you go to seminary? Where is your 
examination certificate, where, where's the proof that the other pastors and theologians of the church agree that you are fit for this office? And who's called you? If they didn't call him, they would not accept that. Um, so that's, that's a very different approach than I think most Protestant churches take. It's actually a little closer to a hierarchical model uh, where the bishops would place guys in churches whether the church asked for them or not. Lutherans from very early on had it more of a, of a consistory type way. But the church itself did have a say in who their pastor would be, but not in a higher or fire sense, in a recognition that this is actually a divine work, that God the Holy Spirit is calling a pastor to be our pastor through the action that we are taking, and for that reason we don't remove them for very much, unless it's very serious. And that'll be actually a question further down in the frequently asked questions part. So there's a lot more that could be said on this. It doesn't always get taught very well, even amongst our own circles. And obviously part of the difficulty is every pastor who becomes a pastor did have some sort of inner sense of, you know, I really feel like God is laying it on my heart to do this, to pursue this. And so we don't want, we never want to deny the validity of that, but that's also not what we mean when we say the divine call or when a pastor is standing up at the start of the service and says, as a called and ordained servant, I'm not saying I had a, a vision like Isaiah had in Isaiah chapter six, where God appears to him and the train of his robe fills the temple. And he says, who shall I send? Here am I, send me, send me. Right? Who, nobody can question Isaiah. In that case, it's a prophetic calling from God to the prophet. We're not saying that every single pastor has to wait until he has one of those. And that you can't question the call. My call is actually a document that's hanging on my on my wall in the office from St. John's. And I also have the one from the first churches that called me uh, from when I went from being Matthew Moss to Reverend Matthew Moss. Right, so that call and ordination actually matters and has a specific process in it. Uh, so some some frequently asked questions here. Why doesn't the LCMS ordain women? Obviously, we acknowledge there are other church bodies worldwide that don't do that either, but why don't we? Uh, the office of the holy ministry is something that we believe was instituted by Christ himself, so holy scripture gets to set the parameters. Who can, who cannot, under what situations, etc., etc. So, beyond simply prohibitions, of which there are two pretty clear ones, 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2, uh, both dealing with the church in its gathering as church, um, with the role of women preaching or teaching, Paul says clearly no. But beyond simple prohibitions, we also would consider our Lord's example of choosing 12 men as to, uh, to fill the apostolic office, even as he had other disciples who are women. Disciple just means student. And in that way, the, the New Testament church did actually have or was more inclusive than even the Jewish synagogues they came out of. In the synagogue service, the point at which the women and children would be excused uh, would be prior to the teaching portion we would call a sermon. In the church, they were still present for the sermon and the sacraments, right? So there is, uh, we can't, we would, we would reject as completely unhistorical and false the idea that the church was just following with the pagan and Jewish patriarchal culture that was around them. No, that's, that's blatantly false. Rabbis did not take female disciples. Jesus did. The synagogue uh, ushered women and children out after the reading of scripture prior to the teaching, the church did not. The church baptized and has women as heirs of salvation. So just because Paul says when talking about salvation that there is no more Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, right, before God, in baptism, in salvation, as heirs of heaven, there is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. Is that verse saying anything about the pastoral office, though? No. And that's where one of our rules was taking verses in context. Right? So we take the verses that are dealing with the ministry on their whole. And if it's talking about salvation 
or who is a member of the church, we take that on its whole. Uh, so that's the part of how we would distinguish this. Um, looking at the Old Testament, you have an exclusively male priesthood uh, from the Levites. And that also is not just them imitating the culture. Let's be honest. The pagan nations around Israel in the Old Testament and the Roman uh, pantheon of gods included female goddesses and female priests. It is countercultural that the Old Testament priesthood and the New Testament church had a male-only pastorate. It's, it's a complete historical myth that we were just copying cultural norms and the whole world was patriarchal. No, on its surface, that's false. There are female priests in pagan religions that they interacted with. So it wasn't just, that, that's just such a straw man argument against the biblical prohibition uh, or the biblical description of a male only pastorate. So beyond those two as well, um, most importantly, the whole doctrine of creation bears on this topic. We learn the blessed teachings of things like headship and order within the family estate, as well as the church and the civil estate. Uh, gender distinctions being a good thing, that God did create men and women differently and gave them different skills and different responsibilities. Uh, all of that bears on this same topic, not just because it's talking about pastors or genders, but even relative to how husbands and wives and fathers and mothers have different things that they give their children. Right? A child needs his father and his mother. Where that's not possible, it's often a tragic circumstance. And the child has to be uh, uh, brought up and you know, adjusted for that. Right? If dad's killed in a car accident when the, when the child is little, you look to an uncle or to male teachers or even to the pastor to kind of provide some of that male influence, whether it's a son or a daughter, to to uh, fill in that what, what loss has happened, because it is a loss. We don't want to pretend it's not a loss. Right? This is the, the lie of equality or egalitarianism as it is in our society. Men and women are not the same. We can talk about them equal in certain aspects, but they're not the same. They're not created to be the same. They don't act the same. And to pretend like they're interchangeable is just a lie. They're not. They're not. God did not create them to be that way. In the very creation, he says, I will make a helper compatible for him, fit for him. Uh, this is the complementarity of it, that what man does not have or cannot do, woman does, and vice versa. What woman cannot do or does not do, man does. Uh, so that the fact that that would extend also to the pastoral office really shouldn't be that much of a, of a shocking idea. Um, it only is in much modern recent times because we started pretending like those differences didn't even exist or that they weren't important if they did. The next point also helps clarify or, or at least removes some of the egalitarian objection to this. Uh, so can any man become a pastor? No, it's not simply that women can't be pastors and men can be. Most men aren't fit or qualified to be pastors just based on the qualifications that scripture gives for that, right? So scripture itself provides the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus chapter 1. We could go through those, right? For, for example, one of them is husband of one wife. Not only is that pretty specific to males, not only does it also uh, completely counter the Catholic prohibition from priests to be married, when the qualification you could take the qualification positively. He must be a husband of one wife. So single guys to get married before they're a pastor. You could make that argument. I know some guys who have. Um, we typically take it as restrictive because we know the pagan world had polygamy that it meant that anybody who would convert to Christianity who already had more than one wife was disqualified. They're still a Christian. We would, even our missionaries today in Africa run into this in some tribes. You convert a, a tribe of people that's been practicing polygamy, what do you do? Do you just turn out the wives two through 10? No, you admonish them 
to care for these women, be sexually faithful or having children only with one of them, but you then don't take that person and make him a pastor, one, it's not going to be easy for him on a pastor's salary to care for 10 wives. And he now owes that responsibility to all. So some of that is just the recognition there that um, due to the, the family requirements that this man owes his family, even after conversion, he's not going to put away the other women, especially in a culture, even like modern African tribes, where they don't have another way to be provided for. That would not be good either. So they stay together, but then you don't take that person and put him into a pa as a pastor. Recent converts. Paul makes a very clear point. Recent converts should not be put into office of ministry, or they may fall into the temptation of the devil. That's what he described. Drunkenness. Not able to be a pastor. Um, apt to teach is one of the big ones. That, at least it's big in the way that why do we have college and seminary training, right? I said the two, first two parts were education and examination. Because the person does have to be, as Paul says in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, able to teach. If you're not able to teach the faith, you can't be a pastor. And so when a guy fails out of seminary, he's not up to the task. He's not able to do the teaching portion. Um, so it just goes into the, the whole big picture. We're not talking that all women are incapable and all men are capable. No, scripture itself has set the parameters we just faithfully do the best we can to follow that. Um, one of the qualifications there is that he must be above reproach. That doesn't mean sinless, because nobody is without sin, but above reproach, reproach would be this public scolding. Right? Above, so a reproach would be a public rebuke for public failure, for public sin. Um, Somebody who is in that position already, before they go to seminary or get ordained, probably just shouldn't be. Uh, people like to make exceptions with like, well, look at St. Paul. He was a persecutor of the church. Yeah, he also had Jesus appear to him directly on the road to Damascus and put him in the office. Let's not use that as an example that anybody who has a backstory should be put into office automatically. No, maybe they have enough qualms about their past that they think I wouldn't be the best person to teach and lead a church on why not to do this. We know it's a, I mean, it's a logical fallacy, right? The, it's called two quote way. If you tell your, your kids, don't do this. They say, well, dad, you did it when you were a kid. It doesn't matter. That's irrelevant. I'm telling you not to do it. That's the fact. Uh, but to be honest in the church, when it comes to pastors, there is something to that, that they need to be above reproach. Uh, this leads to the next question on your sheet, the final, or the, uh, or the next half of that answer, that some pastors can get removed from office, but it usually is restricted to those things that are actually specifically named in 1 Timothy 3 or Titus chapter 1. They have, so those are the qualifications for the office. The disqualifications happen too. So, a pastor would be removed or disqualified when he persists in false teaching, meaning he's been corrected and shown from Scripture that he's wrong and he refuses to take that back. Uh, that's happened occasionally, uh, not, not as often as it probably should. It should probably happen more often than it does. But number two, uh, gross moral failure. Typically, we're talking about a public sin, but... I know guys who have privately resigned. I don't know what they did, but they, in their own resignation, cited moral failure. That they, in their own conscience, had done something that they could no longer, in good conscience, continue in the office of ministry, and so they resigned. It's private. I'm not going to start inquiring as to what, where, when, how, who, whatever. I trust their knowledge of what they've done. With uh, there, there's whole center. I know we're over time already, but uh, we'll just finish this one up. There are whole counseling centers for pastors who have fallen from the office, and one of them, which has been doing this for decades, even said that you could probably count on one hand the number of times it's not an affair, 
and from the people that I've crossed paths with in, uh, in ministry, the cases where it's known or, or where the, the public moral failure is known, it's almost always of a sexual nature. Um, sometimes it's just plain they divorced their wife and left. It's a little trickier or messier when the wife leaves the husband and not every district president agrees on whether that person should still be in the office or whether they need to leave the office to take care of their family. Is that, I mean, this is just the fact of the matter. My wife has one husband. You can get another pastor. So if the marriage is suffering that much, he needs to take care of his marriage and family. The church can get another pastor. So that's where some church, or some districts have said, listen, if, you're, if your wife leaves you or something like that, you might need to step back from the office. You've got something else to take care of. Uh, others would say, well, he's not the one who's at fault, so he's fine to stay. That's, that's not good. I think our church body should probably get on the same page on that one. Um, so typically it's been that. I know one guy where it was a gambling addiction. Uh, that was in my circuit on Vicarage. He was in casinos day and night. Would not repent, did not see it as a problem. Uh, occasionally there's alcoholism that leads to it. But more often than, you know, overwhelmingly, it's Sixth Commandment issues. So uh, when we tell you to pray for your pastors, pray for your pastors. Yeah. In just the eight years that I've been out of seminary, four of my classmates are no longer in the ministry. Um, and none of them actually for moral failure, of their own part at least. Two of them, uh, their wives just up and left the family. And so in order to care for his children as a single dad, he had to get a new line of work. Um, one case, the church that he was called to just kept shrinking. It was already pretty small, and so they couldn't afford a pastor anymore. He had to find other work. Um, and in one case, there was a mental health one, uh, which comes into the third one. So false teaching and gross moral failure, those are pretty, uh, pretty strict. The third one is a little... A little tougher. Sometimes mental or physical health deterioration means you're no longer able to do the job. Not everybody is willing to admit that themselves. Right? So sometimes the church and the district has to intervene and say, you really can't do this. You're not up to the task. Uh, you can't perform the duties that you are needed to perform. You need to resign. So those are the cases in which a pastor would be expect or asked to leave the office. Even individual congregation constitutions are required to specify those three as the only reasons they could. You can't just fire your pastor because you don't like him, right? That's too worldly. Right? That's not honoring the divine call that God calls a pastor through the church. Uh, so it's those things. We're out of time to deal with the other offices, both in the New Testament church, something like deacons, or uh, in the church today, where our church does have other offices that we use the language of call but they're not the office of the ministry, um, not to mention the hierarchical offices, which would be another topic as well. Um, and uh, we can take that up maybe another time. All right. Thank you all for coming. Next week will be our last one for the, the six chief parts, after which, as I said, you'd be uh, welcomed to profess your desire for the sacrament and be received in that way, but we'll probably have another meeting, another class after Christmas break just to do some of these odds and ends, uh, Lutheran lingo, terminology, structure and life in a congregation, that kind of stuff. So, all right, have a great day.